Jeffrey hasn't read 12 Rules for Life. Jordan Peterson is a misogynist. I'm not reading his book. But Jeffrey's a submissive, feminine man, just like the media wants him to be. He ignores self-improvement books like 12 Rules for Life or The Way of the Superior Man because he thinks that masculinity is toxic. Adonis. Adonis has read and implemented every self-improvement book that he could get his hands on. Through that journey, he's become masculine, strong, and wealthy. Whilst Jeffrey stalks his crush on social media, the women stalk Adonis. The first rule for life from Peterson is stand up straight with your shoulders back, and it's my favorite one. It goes a lot deeper than just your body language of, you know, putting your chest out with your, your shoulders back and you're standing up with good posture. What he explains to us is that your body language may actually correlate with your position in society. So if you're somewhat of like a big to male, your body language will be more slumped over and you'll be more like neurotic, anxious, and actually less happy. Like your happiness, serotonin, dopamine, and testosterone seem to heavily correlate with your position in the social hierarchy. Essentially how close you are to being the alpha male. In the modern day, it's so like unacceptable to talk about this term of the alpha and the beta and everyone calls it cringe, but like there's still real evidence that shows the more that you progress to being more of like an alpha and you get better in society and you, and you honestly, you beat other guys, the happier you're going to be and the higher your testosterone is gonna increase. Peterson says that a pretty fast way to implement this and you know, to fast track our journey to becoming more alpha and to you know, get to the top of society is to already assume the body language of a guy who's confident and you know, who's up there already. So many guys you will see just with the body language of just defeat, anxiousness, neuroticism. I always just see him just indulging in their phone, you know, at some bus stop or so. I just see like, you know, kids, like teenagers sat there. You can't see it right now, but I just see them like this, like using their phone like this, head down, like a C-shaped body like this. When you have that weak and quite small body language, people are automatically gonna see you and identify you as the guy who's gonna be down there. Because think about it, this is a total evolutionary trait inside of us. We don't like, you know, neurotically think about body language and oh, that guy's got po pos uh, really good cop body language so he's got to be like an alpha male we don't think that exactly but just something clicks into our brain in the first impression that we make of someone which is made within like a second by the way the first impression that we make of someone is built up and we kind of assume where he is in the social hierarchy and if you see some guy come in and he looks like a little bit of a nerd and he's got poor body language you're not going to straight away think oh i bet i bet he's the alpha male i bet he fucks a lot of women i, I bet he's so rich of course not you're going to think oh yeah he's probably a nerd he's probably plays video games he's down there but imagine you see a confident looking guy with almost like this military style disciplined body language which walk in. You're gonna think, oh shit, okay, that guy's gotta be a little bit higher. He's gotta be disciplined. He's probably got the respect of other men. Look at him, like stand up like he actually like owns the place. And instantly, when your first impression is made of him, you'll actually go and treat him like that. You see, Altering your body language is one of the fastest ways to get people to treat you better. Now, the issue is that if you alter your body language around people who already know you, it will seem as fake and manipulative and you know they'll just like think, okay, what is he doing? Whatever, you're still the chump, right? But the first time that someone sees you, if you've got better body language, you know, like someone new sees you, their judgment is made of you within a second, bro. They're literally judging you entirely of just how you look. And of course, you know, how attractive you are, your style, the way that you look is quite important, but literally just the size of you and just your body language and the way you present yourself is going to be a huge part of someone's perception of you. So next time you walk into a room and there's new people that you've never seen there before, why allow their initial first impression of you to be the guy who's slumped over and instantly they're going to think that you're down here and if they think that you're down there, they're going to just end up treating you that way. You don't want that. Walk in with some confidence. They're going to see you there with their first impression and the way that they talk to you and the way that they speak to you. It's going to be like as if you're up there anyway, which is going to help you to improve faster. The second rule from Jordan Peterson is to treat yourself as if you are someone that you're responsible responsible for helping. So in other words, just be kind to yourself as if you're your own best friend. What would you say to yourself? Imagine you're stuck in a rut right now. Like imagine you're stuck with this addiction to video games or porn. What would you say to your best friend? And how would you help your best friend navigate that? Really like a good best friend of yours. Not like, you know, some prick that you don't even like, but like a guy that you really care about. Imagine your son. You wouldn't like scream at him and see, say he's a bad person for being addicted. Like we know porn's so fucking addictive. We know video games are so addictive. We wouldn't think that our son who's succumbed to the addictions of these platforms was a bad person. We would try to help him, wouldn't we? And yet when you talk to yourself in your own mind, you belittle yourself and you have these beliefs of, of negativity and this like self-deprecation. How about you actually treat yourself as someone that you like? This may be one of the most important rules in the book and also just things to keep in mind in general. I say this so often, but the beliefs that you have about yourself largely make up your life. It is of utmost importance that you investigate the beliefs that have been implanted into your mind by your parents, your teachers, by society, by you know your childhood years. Because maybe your parents put this belief into your mind that you're a piece of shit, 
Maybe they criticize you when you were struggling with a problem. You were struggling with studying and you got poor grades and you needed extra support. And your parents shouted at you and said you're a bad person, that you're lazy, that you procrastinate. And you know, it seems okay. Well, they said that because you're lazy and you procrastinate. You know, they're just observing something. But the thing is, whatever your parents said to you when you were a child deeply shapes how you become when you're older. So if you had a parent who said, oh yeah, little Jeffrey is really lazy. Oh, you always procrastinate. That's going to be so deeply inside of you, like a belief that shapes your identity, that even decades later, you may be more lazy, you may procrastinate more than you actually should, just because it's kind of assumed in your identity that that's what you do. Mark my words that improving your identity or changing it entirely is one of the fastest ways to improve yourself. If you really want to put your self-improvement on the fast track, spend some time right here, right now, and think of what your identity is. Because if you don't see yourself as an athlete, right here, right now, why wouldn't you just choose to just identify as an athlete? Bro, I'm look, I will look at you today. I am an athlete. I am a leader. Change your fucking identity to the thing that you actually want to be. Update your identity to a new realistic endeavor. If you've been like getting into the gym for the past few months and you've been dieting and you've been learning about macros and protein and you've been going into the gym and hurting your fucking muscle for months or maybe years, you are an athlete. But if you still see yourself as a video gamer, as you still see yourself as like a little nerd who barely gets off his computer chair, well then you're gonna always have this level of friction because you're not aligning yourself to your identity. The moment I, I said to myself, I am an athlete, I started waking up at five every single day, running to the gym in pitch black darkness and training, no problem. I got shredded out of nowhere and I, I was struggling like with binge eating and my weight for like literally a year straight. Boom, I'm, I'm an athlete. No, no, no thanks. I don't eat that junk food anymore. Alarms on at 5 a.m. because I'm an athlete. That's what athletes do. I wake up early and I go and exercise. I like exercise because I'm an athlete. I'm a leader. You know how many guys think that it's like cringe or obnoxious that I call myself a leader? They might be right. Maybe I'm not like a great leader or something, but the thing is, it's only gonna help me if I see myself with that identity. So when someone tries to call me out for like the identity that I have for myself and I, I genuinely think I'm one of the best leaders of our entire generation. Name another guy who's 20 to 25 years old who's leading as many guys as I am. I may be literally the best leader of our entire generation. Of course, there's people who are older than me who've got more influence, absolutely. But of guys who are about 20 years old, pick out another guy. There's probably not. And so I have the identity that I'm literally the best leader of our generation. And that helps me take this shit seriously. That helps me wake up at five or half four every morning. The first thing that I do is hop onto Discord and, and talk to one of my boys. The first thing that I do every single day, name another guy who does that. So I have the identity that I am the best leader of our generation and that helps me deeply. So what is your identity? Because whatever you want to accomplish, whatever it is that you want, you want good grades, you want to get a girl, you want to get really athletic and get really in shape, you want to make a lot of money. Trust me when I say that if those things are not aligned to your identity, you're not going to make any real progress at all. If you keep finding yourself, you know, trying to do the habits, meditating, reading, whatever, and you, you know, you do them a little bit, then you just snap back to this like starting point. You just keep going back to this fucking degenerate days of you just like, yeah, hopping on your computer and just searching for more answers, staying on like this crusty computer computer chair, jacking off every couple of days, wasting time here and there on, on video games. I'm telling you right now, it's because this is your identity. You'll always fall to where your identity is. I'm spending so much time on this topic because you must take this seriously. Whatever your identity is, that's going to be your baseline and you will fall to your baseline thousands, tens of thousands of times over the rest of your life. So why not change your baseline instead of changing the activities and the habits that you do? Because updating your habits is nice. You know, getting into meditation is nice. Getting into journaling is nice. But those things are useless if you haven't changed your identity. Take some time right now. What is your identity and what is the identity that you need to reach the goals that you have. It's not the things that you need to do. It's who you need to become. Make sure you change that. The third rule from Jordan Peterson is to make friends with people who want the best for you. There's a video on my second channel, Hamza Unfiltered, and it's titled, They're Not Your Friends. The video's almost got a million views. You might want to go and watch that. I'll just leave this entire section for that video because I've explained the whole concept in detail there. The fourth rule for life by Jordan Peterson is to compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to other people. This is something that I think a lot of people take the wrong way. A lot of people in this modern day, especially men, have become so weak that they've started to overlook the importance of competition. When Peterson says this, don't compare yourself to someone else. And when you know you hear these like big, like masculine type of guys say, oh, I don't compare myself to anyone else. They're not talking about it in the same way that you think. There's a difference between comparing yourself to someone else and competing with someone else. Competing with someone else is absolutely essential. If you say to yourself right here, right now, that I'm not in competition with anyone else, I guarantee you won't become that successful soon. It's competition 
politician that makes a young man wake up early because he has an enemy to work towards. We need an enemy. We need someone to beat. When I've got someone to beat so clearly in my mind, bro, I can't help but wake up at 4 a.m. I can't help but like have this level of aggression that I'm going to take over. I'm going to take what they've got. But comparing yourself to someone else, that's a bad thing. Comparing yourself is literally you seeing someone else and feeling bad that you are not that person. Comparison comes from this like inferior position of like, oh yeah, like I'm not so great and that guy is so great. So I feel even worse. And I, you're like looking down the social hierarchy, like thinking, oh yeah, I'm so bad. I'm so bad. I'm not as good as that guy. That's a very bad trait. It comes often from social media because when you're on social media, you can't help but compare yourself. The thing is when you're on scrolling on social media, your brain isn't stuck in like competitive mode. So you're literally just scrolling. You see someone better than you, who's richer than you, who's got a better physique than you, who's got a girlfriend and you don't. And your brain instantly just compares your life to his, shows that he's way better than you. It's like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm a piece of shit then. And like we just said in the first point, when you know that you're quite low down in the social hierarchy, your, your happiness, your dopamine, your serotonin, your testosterone all goes down. You don't want to compare yourself to someone else, but what you do want to do is see someone who's somewhat similar to you. Not way, not way, way, way better, but someone similar and think to yourself, yeah, I could be better than him. There's a difference. Comparison is like a very negative, self-deprecating mindset and competition is an aggressive mindset. Be competitive don't compare. Number five, do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. This is a tricky one because I'm a big believer that traumatizing and abusing your children is, is not good. And that seems like common sense, right? This rule for life from Jordan Peterson, and I might be taking this out of context, maybe he'll explain it better than I can, but I think this is referring to not becoming like your child's friend. So of course, you know, we're, we're kind of young right now, okay? But when we go and have children, the modern day around us is raising children to be very weak and protected. And if a child does something, like swear at their parents, which is a normal thing that's happening these days, bro. In some cultures, like I don't want to be racist, but it seems to be just like white parents and white kids. White parents raise their kids to just, it's okay to swear at them for some reason, bro. You never see that in a fucking like minority household ever. I don't know what, what's happening like the fucking godless west degenerates here but it's like it's okay for children here to literally swear at their parents to scream at them to tell them to fuck off and stuff bro the few times i've ever swore at my parents i got my ass beat you know what's very interesting the times that i look back and i've actually been traumatized like fully like, like i don't say this to be like some mental health victim or some shit like oh i've got trauma but like i've literally like scientifically got fucking proof that i've like have have trauma from my childhood the few times that i can remember that i totally got traumatized was not from times where I kind of deserve to be disciplined. This is very interesting and I don't think anyone talked about this. I'll very briefly go over it here. Maybe I should make another video. From what I can think right now, the times that I most like dislike my parents and the times that I look back with so much, like, you know, this built up like anger and, and like sort of these flashbacks and everything, which encapsulate trauma, is the times when it totally out of place for me to be disciplined like that. So it was the time that, you know, me and my brother were like shouting at each other a little bit. Then my dad comes in and aggressively hurts us. That's really bad. Where it was suddenly and it, you know, it wasn't deserved. Whereas the times that I think about the times where I kind of deserve to be disciplined. That never traumatized me, even though I still got like abused in that sense. The issue is that I think most parents have this all flipped. We see a lot of parents in this modern day who don't discipline their children at all because they think like, oh, you know, children are so sensitive and we can't like risk traumatizing them. And you should not traumatize your children. But I think there's a fine line that if you let your child, quite frankly, act like a prick, if you're not going to discipline your child, eventually the world's gonna discipline him. And that's gonna be a way harsher lesson. And we're seeing that today with, when I look at like 18 year olds today, 16 year olds today, a lot of them are just f like, stu like, I don't wanna be horrible, but a lot of them are literally just like so weird. Coming from like an Asian household, coming from like a Muslim household where I got like, I got slapped, I got beat. The thing is, I don't think those things are good either. But look at like the man I've become today. I've become disciplined. I've become like self-regulating. Whereas I see children today that never got disciplined when they should have. I used to see kids like literally scream and, and swear at their parents and they're just weirdly addicted to instant gratification. It's like if a parent tried to become their child's friend, that child ends up turning into a total fucking degenerate who goes to the pub three times a week to drink pints here. If you want your child to become like that, yeah, be easy on them be nice on them. I don't think you should physically harm your children ever, but I think that your children should feel very disciplined by you. And I'm just going to be totally honest. I don't really know how to navigate that, that sort of dichotomy just yet, but I am sort of wanting to look into that. But I will not have children who are fucking spoiled brat. You need to discipline your child and you need to not expect to be your child's friend. I will not be my children's friend. They will not see me as their friend. People think that this is weird when I say this about my girl, 
we're not friends. I call her my girl and not my girlfriend. We, we even like cringe at the term girlfriend, boyfriend. We're not friends. I know that he's talking about children in this, this rule for life, but you must understand that there's people who you can be very close to who don't have to be your friend. Me and my girl, I love her so much. She's not my friend at all. That's fucking dis like, that's weird. Maybe that seems weird to you right now thinking like, hey, why, why don't you say your friends? But that, that's, bro, once you get a little bit more knowledgeable on the masculine energy, you realize you don't need to be friends with a girl for her to respect you and love you and actually to have an amazing time with her. If anything, honestly, I, w I think our relationship's so fucking good because we're not friends. Because if we were, I would have lost attraction to her and she would have lost attraction to me, which is what happens in all these fucking relationships where, oh, we're like best friends. We spend all day talking to each other. Fuck off. I won't be offensive. Maybe that's what some people's preference is. But with these parents who want to be their children's best friend, you usually see this with like degenerate parents who didn't even want to have their children at that age. And they end up wanting to become friends with their, with their children because they want to live vicariously through them. So you'd see this with the overbearing mother who like wants the, the boy to essentially turn into like a little bitch, little pussy and he, he like you know to keep him like nice and safe and secure or you see this with the um the, the thought kind of mother who then encourages her daughter to like you know dress up and be really pretty and put on loads of makeup and go out yeah just go fuck some guys it's okay like because she's living vicariously through that maybe i've got this all wrong because this is something i've not totally researched enough just yet and maybe we can go find like you know what peterson's actually said and maybe some people will comment and say oh no he, he meant to say something else but i'm pretty sure it just means like be a parent be a role model be like a discipline figure be a masculine father not a friend this is quite it's a, it's a fucking red pill bro but the girls that i've dated before my my current relationship and i've all i always observe their parents and when i see one her dad's not in the house because the parents are, i'm like okay this come on but two when i see that her dad is like her friend and he's like a little pussy and he's like kind of feminine and he's not masculine. I know for a fact that she's gonna have problems. And like, I've left relationships, multiple, handful of relationships, just because I've seen that her parents are like her friends. And it's just like this weird fucked up dynamic where I start seeing like her mother's gonna encourage her to be a thought because her mother's like living vicariously through her party days and stuff. And her dad's just being like a little feminine pushover. You can't be parents like that. Rule number six, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. And this is something that I really had to do. So I made my YouTube channel in May, 2020 and I, only actually started posting videos after I had implemented the things that I was speaking about. I saw at the time, and I don't want to call people out, but I saw YouTubers at the time make videos and I could tell for a fact they weren't even talking. Bro, someone said this yesterday, bro. I was on a, a video call with one of my followers. So every morning I go onto my big Discord server and I take like a video call for 20 minutes or something with one of my boys. And he said this word that really made me happy. He said like, oh yeah, you came in and changed the self-improvement game because it was just trash before you. And I don't want to put down any of the, the creators because they're, they're still kind of around. Like, But all the the YouTubers who were here before me making kind of self-improvement videos like I don't think any of them really had integrity I would watch like these self-improvement gurus and stuff and these productivity guys you probably like you know these big productivity channels of like these guys wearing clean shirts and stuff and none of them literally like just none of them were masculine at all they were all like these fucking little skinny guys talking about discipline and talking about productivity and I was just thinking bro how are you teaching about me about productivity if you don't even go to the gym you're teaching me about productivity if you're not consistent in the gym shut the fuck up bro honestly shut the fuck up if if you're like if you're not jacked fair enough okay fair enough but if you're not consistently exercising which is a fundamental need for men for humans if you're not exercising bro shut up trying to preach to anyone else that was the big push when i saw all these fucking youtubers who were just either they didn't exercise or they weren't even like confident or social with girls like they, they were so awkward around you could tell that they were kind of awkward around girls or they weren't even that successful you could just tell that they, they they had no integrity of the things that they were preaching i came in as a fucking disciplined guy who was quite literally spending zero seconds on video games zero seconds on porn, zero seconds on social media, zero seconds on Netflix, everything to change the fucking self-improvement space entirely. At least on YouTube, of course, you know, self-improvement is massive in, in books and everything. And I'm going to transform that era soon as well. But I came in and changed the shit. And the reason why we popped off so much is because people could come in and literally say, you know what? This guy's kind of extreme. He's saying never to play video games. He's saying never to take drugs and stuff. But you know what? There was no one who looked at me and thought, oh, I bet he doesn't preach the things that he's he's talking about because you could tell by the way that I talk somehow you could tell that I was telling the truth you could tell that I when I was speaking about discipline that I was a disciplined guy you could tell that when I would tell you of the stories that yeah every single morning I wake up at 5 a.m to work or every single morning I wake up at 5 a.m and if it's dark if it's raining if it's cold I don't care I will go outside for like a one two three mile run with a weighted backpack eventually get to a tree where I'll set up and start exercising in pitch black you knew that I was telling the truth and that's why we built up such a loyal fan base because for 
for the first time in like the YouTube self-improvement space, there was actually someone who had the integrity to follow the things that he was putting onto you. Because before there's all these like little productivity guys t talking about, oh, here's the best productivity techniques and here's dopamine detox. It's like, bro, shut up. Don't you fucking tell people about dopamine detoxing when you still fucking play video games and you've got a self-improvement channel. Shut the fuck up. Don't talk about like, oh, I tried Marcus Aurelius's uh, morning. Just shut up, bro. All of these guys were making videos for the sake of making videos just because they wanted to be YouTubers. I was already doing this shit in the silence, like in the dark first. Literally, physically, like actually literally in the dark. And then I came onto YouTube and just started posting my learning lessons. And from there, we blew the fuck up because you needed someone with authenticity. The same with David Goggins. He came in in this sort of niche of like fitness and stuff. And this was a guy who had credibility and a reputation of like, oh shit, he is the real deal. He popped off. Andrew Tate came in. He is the real deal. He popped off. You see this rise of this like masculine disciplined guy come in. Like you just see them pop the fuck off and get a million subscribers, two million, five million. Tate becomes the, the most Google um, search person in the world. Goggins goes absolutely viral because you could see some level of integrity with these guys. When you see these self-improvement YouTubers who don't even have a muscular physique and they don't even consistently go to the gym and they're like, oh, well, I just don't even like it. Like that's why people don't respect you. That's why I'm sure that this is why our rise to, um, to like this level of success has been so fucking consistent. If you go and like see some graph of our subscriber count, literally it's not like some like, you know, some lucky day or something. You will literally literally see that it's literally just a consistent graph like this. For the last one and a half years, we've had about a thousand subscribers every single day at least. Some days it's been up to 7k because people can actually see that my house is in order when I preach these things. When I come onto the camera and I tell you about dopamine detoxing and I tell you don't use TikTok, I don't use it. I don't have any bad apps on my phone. When I tell you stop wasting time, when I tell you stop watching porn and jacking off, you can tell that I'm a guy who doesn't even do that shit and that's why my message seems to resonate with so many guys. Rule number seven, pursue what is meaningful. Maybe you're watching this video right now and you're a young man and you're not very certain on what path to take forward, especially when it comes to your financial success. Maybe you're studying right now. Maybe you're considering a couple of different businesses. Maybe consider this career. You know, there's so many options that you can do as a young man. You may as well try all of them, right? So young men will often come to me and say, okay, I'm trying this business and this business and this business. And I'm also studying and this and this and this and this. And they're trying like five, 10 different things at once, five, at least three things at once, right? And that's not very, you know, good to do. It's better to try one thing at once and, you know, really just like give it your all and stuff. But they ask me like, how should you know what to spend your time on? How should you know what to dedicate your life to? I want to be a dropshipper. I want to be a YouTuber. I want to start SMMA and you know, all these different businesses, or I want to try this career or this one or this one. The reason why you're confused and you've got this decision fatigue of all these different pathways is because you're thinking entirely of the reward that you would get from these. Because when you think of the reward, what you want, well then you can consider being a YouTuber because you'll get money, success, freedom. You could consider being a author because you get money, success, freedom. You could consider becoming any number of things because you get money, success, and you know what I mean? Like if you just think totally of the things that you want, the rewards that you want, any endeavor is probably gonna eventually make you money or eventually get you freedom or eventually get you status. You need to consider what is meaningful. You need to consider what you'll need to sacrifice and the problems that you'll need to go through, the pain that you'll need to go through to achieve success in an endeavor. So Peterson says, choose what is meaningful. Don't choose what will just give you a reward of money or something. Choose what actually means something to you. Don't don't just go with the hype. For me, it was always going to be YouTube. And it's interesting that I pursued YouTube at a time when everyone was talking about how oversaturated it was. I shouldn't have started a YouTube channel if I listened to this advice, but I did it because it was meaningful to me. I did it because I love this process and the pain of having to like, you know, set up the camera, speak to the camera and sometimes mess up my words, but hopefully just send like a message out there to people all around the world. I did it because that means a lot to me. You need to figure out right here, right now, what means more to you? Because there's so many different things that you can pursue for the rest of your life. And so many guys just get this decision fatigue, weighing up so many different options because they, they only think about like, oh, well I could make money from this or I could make money from this. That's not gonna help. You need to ask yourself right now, let's say you've got two choices that you could make right now, right? You need to ask yourself, in which of these choices will be the pain that I actually want to experience for the rest of my life? Rule number eight, tell the truth or at least don't lie. Honesty is a very, very important train. It's, it means a lot to me. Honesty is like one of my core values. And that, I haven't done like some, you know, some geeky practice, to like figure out my core values. It's just always, I've always known that like, I'm a very brutally honest person. I've come to the camera and literally told you times that I've totally fucked up. I've told you crimes that I've committed. I've told you literally just total honesty. Now, what I really like is he's wrote, at least don't lie. And that's actually so interesting that he, this is like the, the rule, at least don't lie, because that's exactly what I followed. I will say honest things, 
But if there's a time when I think that honesty may be not the best answer, I just won't lie, but I won't exactly bluntly tell you something. I won't go over exactly, you know, what situation this has happened to me in, because obviously then I'll eventually tell like the truth, which I didn't want to tell in this situation, but I won't lie about it. You need to become a trustworthy person. And more than being trustworthy to other people. Ask yourself right now, do you trust yourself or do you lie to yourself? Do you honestly, like perhaps this is this is way more important than the ability to, you know, have people to trust you. Ask yourself right now, do you trust yourself? If you tell yourself right now, like, oh, you know, I'm a little bit tired, but like I'll do the work tomorrow or, oh, you know, I'll go to the gym tomorrow. Do you believe your own lie? Or are you lying to yourself to, to begin with? When you say something, like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Is that a quick lie that you're just putting in to make yourself feel comfortable and then go back to playing fucking video games or, you know, waste time that you didn't do the productive thing today? How often do you lie to yourself? Instead of saying, oh, you know, I'll do it tomorrow, whatever. why not just tell the truth and say, oh, yeah, I fucked up today, I procrastinated, I made a big mistake, let's see what I can do tomorrow, boom. That's, it's a slight difference, but too many guys just lie to themselves, they lie to other people, and they, they, you just get seen as this, like, person of low status. No one can respect you when you lie to them. Rule number nine, assume the other person knows something that you don't. I like to think of this rule more in the lines of communication and social skills that we've learned from Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. This is the concept of always thinking thinking that no matter who you're talking to, they have some hidden gems, some knowledge inside of their brain that you don't know that you could heavily benefit from in any situation, whether it's you just want to learn from them or you kind of need the truth from them. You should always assume that this other person has some kind of expertise that you'd eventually be interested in. Because if you don't, if you pass a very quick judgment of someone, you can miss out on so many opportunities. Oftentimes, I'm not gonna lie, like I feel like people may feel this way about me. I don't present myself in the best way. I sound like a but like I'm a lot more successful than I actually look like because I I, I like being just not like not normal but I like being just like like low key like I, I wear a fucking bathrobe in my videos when I go out I'm not wearing expensive clothes I don't have like expensive shit or anything oftentimes like I'm not even that well groomed right like and I, I like being a bit like wild and unkept like it's just like my sort of personality and stuff oftentimes I actually kind of feel like sometimes there's people who don't even realize like the person I am just because they were kind of closed off with their initial first impression you see like this angry guy in a bathroom and you think oh yeah he's just he's just like you know some some or something like that sometimes that blows my mind when I speak to someone and I'm asking them questions I'm getting to know them and I leave the conversation like a little bit you know sad upset because they didn't take that much of an interest in me but I I almost like think their social skills weren't that great because I think like, how did you not even get to the point of the conversation where you ask me a question of like, you know, what I do for work and the fact that this is like such a big thing here. Oftentimes like you'll end up speaking to someone that you just see is just like, just weirdly not intelligent when it comes to social skills. And I really hope that's not you. When you speak to someone, just imagine to yourself, this person probably has such a huge fucking gem, just like Hamza may do. Some people will just pass judgment on you and never even try to find out part of your life story. And it's kind of sad because this is how we connect with people. I hope that when I eventually speak speak to you if you join our discord server if you come to the meetups that i host quite regularly like around the world when i'm flying around and stuff i hope that I, at the time i have the awareness and the patience and the social skills to get to know you as a person and to always keep in my mind that you have something in your mind that i would love to hear about rule number 10 be precise in your speech interestingly i'm pretty sure that peterson wasn't just talking about like the length of you know your sentences so he said oh you really use short sentences and be precise i think he was more talking about being more up front with the things that you're saying. So I, I could have this wrong, but from my memory from this one, he more said that we should be precise in the sense that if there is something to say, we should say it as fast as possible instead of waiting around and holding our tongue. When something bothers you and you get this thought of some, you know, like it'll, there'll be a thought in your brain of something that you need to bring up to this person. You know, they've maybe upset you, they've disrespected you, or you need to call them out and you know, you know, you need to like challenge them a little bit. You need to tell them that something bothers you. You need to do that as fast as possible because a lot of people hold their tongue. A lot of people just stay silent holding your tongue and not being upfront with you know the things you need to say to someone often leads to long-term resentment it means a lot to me maybe it would for you especially when you start dating when you realize that you're dating a girl who's kind of holding something in her mind and you know she's unhappy about something and she won't be able to open up to you and tell you you realize how negative of like a personality trait that really is like she's listening right now <laughs> like, you want someone to be precise if there's something that bothers you speak to me as fast as possible. Imagine if my girl doesn't, right? Imagine I've done something that pisses her off or something. And you know, she's a feminine woman. So of course her, her moods go all over the place, which is normal. And you know, it's my job as a masculine man to kind of weather the storm. But imagine that she feels unhappy with me for some reason, but then she doesn't, she's not precise with her speech and she doesn't bring it up to me for some time. Well, then she spent 12 hours being unhappy with me. And that's not right. It's not right for her if she feels negative, but it's also not right for me because now I'm thinking, okay, my girls just felt negative about me all day. It's like, that's not a good thing because eventually, you know, marriages go on 
one like this, where both people hold their tongue. They're not precise with their speech. They just resent each other. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you see this with your parents. They've just got this resentment for each other for the last 10 years. And you know why it started? Because your mom was slightly pissed off that your dad came home 15 minutes late, 10 years ago. And sl she's built that slightly resentment. Imagine this like little bit of resentment is inside of her for 10 years and it's never been dealt with. She was not precise with her speech and did not bring it up to him. So they didn't resolve it. And then another thing. Oh, one time he was a little bit rude and he didn't say thank you when he made food. And another thing, another thing. People hold up so much built up resentment. And in the end, this absolutely makes people so, not hostile, but just, you know, like passively aggressive to each other. Eventually, they just don't even fucking like each other. You probably see this with your parents and it's so fucking sad. I wish you could just tell them like, why don't you just bring it up? But now it's too late. Now it's like, how is she going to bring up? How's your mom going to bring up? Like, oh, your dad came home like 20 minutes later. He said he'd be home at like 5 p.m. But he came home at 5.15 uh, in 2010. <laughs> you can't bring up something that old now, can you? But it's like... You needed to bring it up straight away. If there's something in your mind that needs to be resolved, you must do this. And trust me, I have been so bad with this. There's been times where I've needed to like have a conversation with someone, you know, say something like, okay, that wasn't right. That was disrespectful. Or even to girls to like break up with them and stuff. And there's been times where I've just dragged on that conversation for so long, even with firing people. I've fired a couple of employees. And even with that, it's like, I'll drag it on for an extra week, two weeks, three weeks, months sometimes. I've literally dragged on firing someone for months. And that's just making me resent them that now Anytime they submit some work, I'm like, you know, be, just be, being pissed off towards this guy. I should have just done it fast. If there's something that you need to bring up with someone, be precise. Rule number 11, do not bother children whilst they're skateboarding. I want you to imagine right now that there's a bunch of kids just having a really good time. They're learning to like skate and you know, there were some like older kids who were teaching them like kickflips or some shit. They're all there in the skate park. It's all so fun together. And just randomly, like some weird woman just comes in and starts screaming at them and says, that's dangerous. You're not wearing a helmet. Like, you know, it just gets aggressive. And you might've had this. If you can think back to some times in childhood, you might've had something similar to this where someone just came in and just bothered you when you were having fun. What happened? How did you feel towards that person? How do you feel when your mum just nags you again and again and again about the thing that you're doing that could be dangerous you could oh you know like stop leaning remember like were you in school and you used to lean back on your chair like this and the, the fucking dumbass teacher was, oh you yeah, yeah, don't lean backwards in your chair you know, like if you fall back and crack your head like shut up let me just I, I feel cool when i lean back in my chair like this man come on like if i fall backwards it's on me and it would be my learning lesson wouldn't it imagine if i was in in high school and i'm leaning back on my chair what is the correct way for me to find out that leaning back on your chair could result in some kind of injury well Maybe one day I'll lean back too much and I'll hurt myself slightly and I'll fall over. I won't crack my fucking skull or something. I'll fall backwards and it'll be really scary because I fell backwards. And I might get a little bit injured for years, maybe for the rest of my life after that. I would know that that's an activity that led to some kind of pain and I would probably not do it again. But when some teacher, some parent figure tells you, oh, don't do that. Uh, you can't really respect them and you can't take it seriously. This is something that I think so many modern parents need to hear. It's okay for your children to experience some injuries and trying to protect them from every injury possible is actually probably going to do them more harm than good because the thing is a child falls off their bike and scrapes their knees bro that's fine that's absolutely fine because after that he's gonna get a sense of like okay i did this thing and that resulted in an injury so you know they're gonna be a little bit scared but they'll get back to it they'll get back onto the bike and they won't do that thing again my dad did this perfectly you need a dad who has this kind of like just no it's fine no you're fine you're fine i fell off my bike like you know really bad i've got cuts on my arm or something it's like, oh, he'd say in Urdu, like, oh, chalo tike, like, nothing happened. It's, it's okay, it's okay. What do you think my mom did? Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> and of course, I can't blame her. You know, that's what mothers do. That's what especially feminine women do. Like, they see their child bleeding and it is, you, they can't help it, right? A feminine woman cannot help literally this maternal instinct of like, oh, fuck, like, that's my child and oh my God. But a masculine man, which hopefully you had that as your father figure, will just see you and like, hopefully he's more in control of the situation. You want your dad to look at you and say like, no, he's fine. What's going to happen to you after that? What's going to happen to the pain that you feel after that? Well, daddy said I'm fine. Come on, son, let's, let's go try it again. But this time, don't go too far on that side. What you did wrong was this. How about next time you just don't do that again. That's a learning lesson for the rest of your life. Think about how valuable that experience is. And, and in this weird day, they're trying to protect kids from that. Sure, there's a short term pain and a bit of a scare, but they're trying to protect kids from a long term life lesson just because the parents and the teachers and the society is so fucking weak that we, we need to protect children from all kinds of pain. Bro, when my son's like going on a bike, and you know, like for the first time he's learning how to ride, I'll be there with him, he'll have like a helmet and stuff. But when he falls over, I'm gonna smile when he scrapes his knee. And if you think I'm crazy, if there's someone watching this thinking that I'm crazy or abusive or like weird for this, I speak to that person directly. If you're watching this right now and you think that I'm abusive for the things that I've just said, you will go on to raise cowards and you will feel good about it. Your little boy will be one of these like single mother raised 
boys who ends up being addicted to video games, who ends up jacking off so many times and ends up feeling so depressed and lonely that he can't attract any girls because he's not masculine at all. That's what we're seeing today. That's what we're seeing with the rise of like single mother households, which don't have this masculine father figure saying, oh, it's okay. It's okay. Look, he's fine. So now we have these boys who are getting boo-boos. As a child, you hurt yourself. Oh, he's got a boo-boo. We're getting boys with boo-boos and they don't have the masculine father figure telling them like, it's okay. So all they're hearing from their mom is all this shrieking. And so now this child's fucking traumatized because it, you know, mommy's saying it's this bad. So it, it should be bad. I'll never skate again because it's really scary. Can you think back to a memory that you've got right now of a time that your dad wasn't around for whatever reason and it was just your mother's sort of feminine sort of like, you know, fear and pain. And suddenly, if you can really think back, bro, it, this will be so interesting. Think back to the time that this happened and ask yourself, what is your relationship with the activity that caused that injury, that boo-boo? Because let's say if it was, you know, you tried skateboarding or something. Did you stop skateboarding shortly after that? I wouldn't be surprised if you did. I'm so grateful that I had a masculine father who taught me how to ride a bike and not my mother. Because I started riding a bike when I was like 10 years old and I fell over a bunch of times. And you know, it's so, so fucking painful. It's a child, it's so, you know, he's crying and stuff. My dad's words always in my mind. Chalotika, chalotika, kuchbinia, kuchbinia, which means, no, it's fine. Oh, it's, it's nothing, it's nothing. When your dad says that, and you're a little boy who, who respects his dad and looks up to him. When daddy says it's okay, well then, yeah, well, it's okay. And so many kids these days, especially boys, are raised without father figures. And so all they hear is this feminine fucking shriek. And now they never go on bikes ever again. And so you see all these guys who are in a state of comfort. Well, what do they do? Because they're not allowed to play out, it's too dangerous. They're not allowed to go on bikes, it's too dangerous. Well, they end up being fucking recluses. And they end up, the only thing that they can do is stay at home and play video games because their mom thinks that that's safe enough. Then he turns into a fucking coward watching porn, watching another man fuck the woman that he wants. And he wishes he could be that masculine guy. And he watches shit like fucking UFC, hoping that like, you know, vicariously living through masculine men who are getting bloodied up and he's get, like, getting this sense of like masculine aggression, but he can't do it himself. And finally, the 12th rule for life from Jordan Peterson is to pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. He writes that the world is full of cruelty and negativity. And so when there is an opportunity to just take some time to experience some pleasantness like petting a little cat which you might see on the street or for me i really like observing nature sometimes like you know imagine you go for a walk through a park right now there's like trees outside a lot of people just kind of see the trees yeah whatever but sometimes i like really observing like trees and leaves and actually like really like in awe looking at nature giving it so much more attention to the point that i walk up to a tree and literally like look at its bark and stuff and like doing that just makes me feel alive sometimes it makes me feel like connected to this earth because if you don't do these things and you go about your day just commuting to work you know this gray dull commute to work going to work press the button uh, or you know go to school and just pretend to be focused on on writing and stuff whilst you're thinking of minecraft and then you come back home you just commute in then just distracted by playing video games and shit or just you know work all day all day all, all day you never get to experience like this small burst of pleasantness by just doing something wholesome when you see like a little cat or whatever or even like a bird sometimes like the, you know i'll literally just look at a bird like i'll just watch a bird and i, I don't mean like bird watching as a sport but i'll just be out and about if i'm walking or if i'm out inside and i see out the balcony or something and i just but like, just look at it for once bro be aware and be present of like some of the beauty of the world instead of just always just neck down just totally indulging in your phone that is the 12 rules for life by jordan peterson if you want to read the entire book i'll find like a way to have an amazon affiliate link in the description boom click and watch this video right now do the hard work especially when you don't feel like it Mwah.